Are you ready to heal your heartache and reclaim your joy? Join us as we dive into an inspiring conversation with Deborah Piva, a board-certified life coach and author who shares her journey of overcoming heartbreak and finding true happiness in life. If you are ready to break free from limiting beliefs and step into a life filled with positivity and fulfillment, then tune in to this episode of Coffee with Tea. So please, stick around and enjoy the show. Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Coffee with Tea. I'm your host, Tanya Tyler, and I'm excited because we're going to connect with a fellow meetup organizer, but we're not really going to dive too much into meetup. She has other great plans that we're going to have a great conversation. So Ms. Deborah Paiva is here to talk about how to um, heal your heartache and reclaim your joy. So without me I'm taking up too much more of this conversation, I want to welcome Ms. Deborah to the conversation, my friend. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. I'm it's a excited. pleasure to be here. And I always love to turn the mic over to my guests so they can best, um, you know, share who they are and what you do. And I want to also let our audience know how we connected. And again, we are fellow organizers on Meetup. That's how we connected. On the, and so it's I'm a pleasure to be here. Thank you for accepting my invitation. So Ms. Deborah, the floor is yours. Please tell a bit about who you are and what you do, my friend. Oh, thank you, Tanya. I am a board certified life coach, speaker, and the author of a book called Heal Your Heartache, Five Steps to Reclaim Your Life After a Breakup, Divorce, or Loss of a Partner. I'm also a jazz vocalist. Um, and I, so I've been doing things in the public eye for a very long time, but probably the biggest thing about me is life purpose. I've always been searching my entire life. It was always about why am I here? Why am I in this lifetime? What am I supposed to be doing? And probably the bit, biggest catalyst in my life was the loss of two husbands. The, my first husband, very young, died very young. And my second husband that I was lucky enough to find um, the love of that part of my life and was married to him for 32 years. Uh, he, unfortunately, I had to walk away from that marriage and we got divorced about 12 years ago. So if anyone's adding up, they can kind of figure out how old I am, but so stop that. Um, but, <laughs> but anyway, um, that that divorce was the catalyst for my book. And it was actually... As I tell my clients, divorce is all about growth. It is not about failure. I had, I did not have a failed marriage. I had an incredible marriage. And the divorce was a way for both of us to grow beyond that. So right. that's pretty much the way I look at, at my life. And right. other people look at their life that way somewhat too. Right. Well, I have to say, first of all, I didn't do the calculations, but you look fabulous anyway. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but Miss Miss Deborah, I was like said, I was reading a portion of your book to prepare for our interview today, and I love where you have the quote, and I wrote it out: "When we are totally present and facing our fears, things often fall. Or when we aren't pay, totally pain, present and facing our fears, things fall apart." So. Can, before we dive into our topics that we talked about, and you talked about, um, there's there are five steps that you share in your book, and we're going to cover two of them. But really, what was, and I know you shared a, it was based off the the heartache and the break of your of your um divorce and your loss of your first husband. But what what was this quote really come out? I mean, they had to have this this realization, this aha moment to realize that. Did you feel like you were present or are do we, you know, where did we lose our disconnect sometimes, like when we're facing these divorces or something like that? You know, what was some of your great insight that you got to, to come up with this quote? Yeah, I think what I think in my marriage, first of all, when we when we walk away from a relationship, 
whether that person actually died or walked away from us or we walked away from them, I think in retrospect, we look back and we see that there were things that we did not want to be present to. We didn't want to see, you know, maybe the relationship wasn't as good as we thought it was. I had to take my rose colored glasses off after the relationship, after I walked away and realized that, yes, I had a beautiful marriage and we had, you know, a wonderful time. Um, my ex-husband was my piano player. And so we did, we played music together and it was very, it was a lot of fun and it was sexy and it was inspirational and all of that. But there were also things going on with him in his own, you know, demons that he was struggling with that I maybe didn't want to face, didn't want to see. I wanted to keep my life joyful and blissful and happy. And so sometimes I think that we only can see those things when we're apart from them, when we can look back objectively. And then we can see things differently and we can look at them and we can say, okay, and then start to separate them. This was me and that was him. And that was really not my issue you know, and it's not my fault because I think with, with breakups comes a lot of guilt, you know, even if it might not be your fault that something fell apart, we still feel like, what didn't I see soon enough? What wasn't I aware of soon enough? What didn't I deal with? What didn't I, why, maybe I should have spoken up sooner and, and dealt with some of this. And I see that, hear this a lot with my clients where they feel like they wasted so much of their life. And I say, nothing is wasted. Nothing <laughs> is wasted. Right. That's all a lesson. That's all a learning process. Right. And I, I like, I'm, for those who, who don't know, I'm, I'm tour, I've been divorced twice. This is my third marriage. So I understand the process of, of reflection and looking back and, and, and not necessarily saying, you know, why me, but what could I have learned from this? What, maybe what did I not see? And I think that's what you're talking about. Like part of what you're talking about, honoring your feelings. And that was um, step one in examining your beliefs. And I, and like I said, before we really dive into it, I was just talking about how we transition and reflect on it. I think when I realized, and I had the same aha moment of, I wasn't present, but at the same time, there's things I needed to grow from that maybe I wasn't are ready to uh, uh i i i dealt with those but i wasn't in the right mindset to deal with it at that time but now that i'm older i'm like oh my gosh you made a mountain of a molehill chief <laughs> you know maybe we could have done a little things a little bit different you know so but that's time of reflection so you know i i i, I love that quote that's why i highlighted it so thank you for sharing are you tired of simply dreaming about success it's time to take action. Join our community of driven entrepreneurs and business owners who are ready to turn their aspirations into a reality. We're more than just talk. We're a collective of like-minded individuals committed to supporting each other's growth and success. Expand your circle of influence and knowledge by joining our dynamic meetup group. Remember, lifetime learners become leaders. It's time to commit to action and join us today. The link to join is located in the description box. Thank you. So you have this great, incredible book um, and you have the five steps. We're going to talk more about the, the two steps, but I want to cover those five steps real quick before we dive into one. You said step one, honor your feelings. Step two, examine your beliefs. Step three, accept your present. I like that. Mm -hmm. Step four, release your past. And step five, transform your thoughts to transform your life. So can we talk about step one? Because you talk about this is a heart process. So mm -hmm. yeah. let's talk about step one. Okay. So this was the heart process was actually something that came to me when I meditated on my healing process that I had gone through. Um, by the time I decided to write my book. And, and to preface that, I wrote the book that I was looking for when, I, when my heart was broken. When I felt that my heart was breaking over my marriage and, and the, the dissolution of it, you know, I, 
I couldn't find the right book. So I read everything and anything. I'm an avid reader and I meditated and I did all those things. But we also sabotage ourselves, as we know, whenever we're going through anything that's painful. And so when I wrote this book and I, I sat and I meditated and I really tried to bring the steps in that I had used for myself, um, honor your feelings made, <laughs> just was the first thing that popped out when I thought of the letter H in the word heart. Uh, honor your feelings because until we actually accept that this is how we feel and we're okay with it, we can't transform those feelings into anything else. We have to sit with it. That's the only way that we learn from whatever it is that we're going through. That's the only way we get the lesson is to really honor that. So if you're feeling sad, it's okay. If you're feeling angry, it's okay. If you're feeling frustrated or, um, or, or just feeling confused, all of that is okay. And the interesting thing is that you know, these steps work in my business as well. Sometimes in my business, I'm feeling frustrated, I'm feeling confused. And I remind myself, just honor your feelings, honor where you are right now, and just kind of sit with it. Yesterday, I had a really bad day. Yesterday, I actually felt a little depressed. And I'm in an incredible relationship right now, and an incredible time of my life. And I'm having, I have absolutely nothing to be depressed about. But yesterday was one of those days and I decided, thinking about our, our discussion today and thinking about my book, I said, just honor that, Deb. Just be okay with where you are. And I think until we're okay with where we are, how can we move to the next step? It's impossible. Right. I like how you say it because a lot of I'm not speaking for everybody, but I know for myself, you know, we we try to say, well, it's I'm it's not, it's just something, you know, where you were trying to push it away or or it's like, oh, I'm not feeling this, or you're like you said, we're trying to come up with a reason why we're feeling this. It's like it must have been because of you know, or this or that. <laughs> like so we we're trying to rationalize, but sometimes it, it is just what it is, and let it, you know, go. Is that sort of like releasing the energy? You know, I mean, is that a little bit about acknowledge your energy so you can dissipate or something like that? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Acknowledging the energy. And then I, there are things we can do. One of the things that I tell um, people, my audience and my clients is, you know, we don't want to stay with sadness too long. There are things that we can do. And the reason that you don't want to stay with sadness too long is because sadness is on the very bottom of the spectrum of emotions. It's the lowest emotion, sadness, depression. Those are the emotions that make people do drastic things. You know, when if some if you can raise that emotion, even to the emotion of anger, it's better because anger is an active emotion. Nobody's going to drive their car off a bridge if they're angry. Nobody's going to run into a tree. No one's going to, you know, slit their wrists. You don't do things like that when you're angry, you're active. And so we don't want to stay in the sadness too long, but we still have to honor it, you know, and you have a right to be sad if something has happened in your life that's put you in that feeling. One of the things that also we can do is not identify with that emotion so much. Instead of saying, I am sad, saying something like, I'm having, I'm feeling an emotion of sadness. It's not who I am. And I knew this even as I was healing my heart, I cried for a year and a half through that divorce process. And I'm not a sad person. And somewhere along the line, I had to remind myself, I'm not sad, I'm just feeling an emotion of sadness. I'm not angry, I'm feeling an emotion of anger. You know, and if we can separate that, then we can start to climb out of that feeling and start to feel a little bit more hopeful about the future. Right. And I like how you're, you're bringing that up. And I'm, and I'm, the question I'm thinking of is like, for those who are like new to this self-discovery and this journey of, of this, and I know you share meditation, but is, is what meditation a, a great way to start like um, surface, like, you know, try, try to say, yeah. lift yourself up from that emotion. I mean, you know, what are some of the practices that people can put in place to help them start to, to, maybe realize that I am not this. 
That I love that. Yes, you're absolutely right. I am not this. <laughs> I am not this. I'm. It's just an emotion I'm having. Yes, meditation is extremely helpful, and and I know that some people struggle with meditation. I was for a very long time a really strong type A personality. I don't think I'm that anymore. I think I'm more of an A minus B plus. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've lowered that level. But for a while, for a very long time, I was an A plus kind of personality, very active. My mind was constantly going. Ne you know, it does, never had. If anyone has ever seen the YouTube video, The Tale of the Two Brains, you know, women, we have, <laughs> we, we cannot stop thinking, it seems. Well, anyway, so a lot of people feel like, well, I can't quiet my mind enough to meditate. Meditation isn't necessarily forcing yourself to quiet your mind. It's just being with whatever emotion you're with at the moment and just quieting the noise a little bit. You're still gonna think about the grocery list that you haven't finished. You're still gonna think about the, oh, I forgot the dirty socks upstairs to throw in the wash. All those things are still gonna come in our head, but it's just a matter of letting them come in and letting them drift back out. Let the thoughts come in and drift back out. One of the ways that I started meditating was just um, counting my breaths. And I no longer have to do that because I've meditated for so many years. But counting your breath is just a way to be actively doing something, but not actively doing everything, <laughs> which is what we tend to do. And then I think the other piece of that is coming out of a meditation and journaling. And meditation, meditating also doesn't have to be a half an hour. It doesn't have to be an hour. It can be five minutes. It can be a walk like you do every day. I think walking is a walking meditation is a beautiful way in nature is a beautiful way to just clear your head. And then journaling is a way to get all of those thoughts out of your head onto paper so that you get those emotions out of your body. Right. Yeah. A great point. Like you said, uh, I, I love, I love talk about this because like I said, Ani, your feelings and just acknowledging it is like key to change I just as as we transform hey there do you love podcasts if so you're in the right place by subscribing to our podcast for only $1.99 a month you'll gain access to engaging and thought-provoking content while at the same time showing your support and appreciation with regular episodes that cover a wide range of topics you're sure to find something that interests you plus subscribing is quick and easy just hit that subscribe button now and never miss an episode. Join our community of podcast lovers and get ready to be entertained, informed, and inspired. Thanks for listening. Talking about how the meditation sort of like helps you, like I said, take those ideas that are all up in your head that's rolling around, like you said, and then putting it down on paper helps us talk about step number two examining your beliefs right we can't change what we don't acknowledge right exactly exactly and i think the belief system is really interesting because if you start thinking about what you actually believe to be true in your life how much of that really came from you or how much of that came from parents things your parents said to you things teachers said to you uh, do you believe that you're do you really believe you're capable of doing certain things, or do you only believe that you're capable of doing certain things because someone else told you that you're capable of doing that? For a very long time, you know, I had the belief that marriage was forever and marriage had to be forever. Why? Because I was brought up, you know, in that belief system. I was brought up with that religious belief that we don't get divorced. No one in my family had been divorced before me. Uh, but then again, no one in my family had gone to gone to college and gotten a college degree before me. So, I mean, we all have to break the mold. But my belief system about I, how I deserved to be happy, I deserved happiness in my life, had to become bigger than my belief that marriage was forever. Right. And, and that was really hard for me. That was really hard. And I think examining our beliefs, what is the belief that's holding you back? What is it? For example, what was the belief that was holding me back from writing my book? Well, people like us, you know, middle-class people don't write books. 
Well, yes, they do every day. We know that now, but, but, you know, our, I think my mother was actually surprised and my mother's no longer with us, but I think my mother was surprised when I wrote my book and she read it three times. And she told me, you know, I never read a book three times. I said, well, why did you read it three times? Well, I didn't want to miss anything. But I think that that's really powerful because I think my mother's belief was that people like us don't create things like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think it was a shock for her, even though she had always told me my entire life that I was a good writer, you know? So that belief helped me. The belief that I was a good writer helped me, but the belief that people like us don't think things like this didn't. And the belief that marriage is forever was a tough one for me to get through. Right. Yeah, I, I can relate. And I, I would say I share I I had the same thing because that's what I grew up. I saw my mom, my my grandmother had long marriages. And when my first marriage failed, I was like, oh, my first thought was, oh, my God, I'm a failure. I can't get marriage right. You know, all these things. And I'm like, Tanya, you know, you know, when I go for the talks, like you said, I had time to examine my thoughts. I had time to sit with myself to actually, you know, say is this true <laughs> you know and I, is that what you're talking about like examining your thoughts and yes. and actually sitting down and processing their thoughts asking yes. yourself um where do these come from is that part of the exactly. process I think journaling you know some of us can do this I have a girlfriend who processes by talking and you know I it took me a while to realize that with her but she really needs to talk out everything. And that's how she processes. Some of us process by writing, by journaling. Some of us process by walking and really thinking. And yesterday I had to, I didn't use the journaling approach yesterday or the talking approach yesterday. I really used the sitting with my thoughts approach to figure out what was going on in my body. Why was I feeling a, a bit of depression? you know, when there, when there seemed to be absolutely no reason for it. And for me, it suddenly hit me that for me, it had to do with my life purpose. I feel like I'm, there's something else coming that I need to be doing, you know, and we, and I, maybe I won't figure that out until I actually journal it out. I think that's how we process. We all process in different ways, but I think using different techniques also can help taking a walk in nature, sitting down quietly, journaling, talking to a friend about how you're feeling, any of those things will work to help us process and get out of our own negative place that we tend to, <laughs> that we tend to put ourselves in. <laughs> those little negative, you know, the, what do they call gremlins in our head? You know, that tell us we're not good enough. We're not smart enough. We're not young enough. We're not old enough. We're not pretty enough, whatever, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like I said, Ms. Deborah has been dropping gems. It's amazing how fast 20 minutes can fly by, but I want to make sure we get a couple of key questions that I'd love to ask. And one question I'd love to always ask is, the, what's the one thing you want the audience to take away from your interview today? That time doesn't heal, we heal. That's probably the biggest thing that I learned from my heartache. I will tell you this, that three years or a little less than three years after my divorce, I ended up having a heart attack and I, and, and I'm healed and my heart is healthy and everything is fine now. But I really believe that that heart attack came from the kinds of things that I was telling myself prior to me really working on this healing process. I was telling myself, my heart was broken. My heart was broken. And as you mm. can see, cutting those words away from myself right now, but I think that what happened is that that's exactly what I created in my body. And so I think that's so important to remember that time is not the healer. We are in control of our lives. We are the healers. We are the ones that can make a difference. Right. Wise words, my friend, wise words. So Ms. Deborah, where can people find more information about you, your services, and where can they pick up the book? Okay, so my book is on Amazon. It's called Heal Your Heartache. And they can find it also on healyourheartache.com. If they go to healyourheartache.com, then that will lead them to the Amazon link. And they can also go to my website, which is deborapiva.com, which is D-E-B-O-R-A-H, 
P is in Peter, A I, V is in Victor, A.com. Either Thank one you, of those Deborah. places. And they can contact me through DebraPiva.com as well. Yes, yes. And make sure you be, you know, she sings. So there's a lot of great stuff that Miss Deborah and I can really dive more into the conversation. And which sort of like leads me to my unofficial question is would you be willing to come back and have a deeper dive, or another conversation? Absolutely. Absolutely, Tanya. This was fun. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really, really love this. Oh, thank you. And again, thank you for sharing your insight and your wisdom with us. It was an honor to talk to you. And I also want to remind everybody who tuned in that remember, feedback is always welcome. Remember, links that Deborah mentioned will be posted down in the description box below. So please make sure you check out those juicy gems down below. If you've enjoyed what Deborah shared today, please make sure you hit that like button over there. And, and if you want to continue getting more of the great insights like Ms. Deborah shared today and many more of the guests that we have on our show, please make sure you hit that subscribe button over there. And remember, last thing first, take things in stride, go with the flow and create your own path. And we will see you back here on another episode of Coffee with Me. All right. Bye-bye.